Hello, my name is Garton Pro, and I've been Challenger since set 2. Last night I was watching Volterix, and I saw a game of his that really impressed me. Volterix is an EUS player, he's one of the best EU players of all time. He's been to Worlds three different times. He has an account that's 1600 LP, another that's 1300 LP. He's like rank 5 EUS right now, so he's a very, very good player. And he played a game that's one of the best games of TFT I've ever seen. A lot of the decisions he made in this game super impressed me, and I think this is basically a perfectly played clear mind game. So I wanted to share this game with you guys, as well as provide my commentary with it. And let me know if this type of content is something you guys like to see, because I will definitely do more of it if this is something people like. We see here we're starting off with Loaded Carousel. A couple things about Loaded Carousel. Obviously, you're getting two items per carousel on this portal. I think on Loaded Carousel, win streaking is a bit better than normal, uh, just because if you're like looking for a specific component, the likelihood you can get it if there's two components on each unit is higher than if there's only one on each unit. And then in addition, I think slamming items early on is a bit better on this portal, uh, just because you're ending the game with three extra components here, meaning that you're more likely to get the better stuff that you want later anyways. Uh, so it's a bit better to just to slam items aggressively. We see here he's playing around the Cassante pair, uh, which is pretty standard. Cassante is probably the best one cost in the game right now. He's just super tanky and does a strong amount of damage too. Uh, so he ends up just being really strong. And we see here he actually buys this bard here. I think the reasoning behind buying this bard here and uh, holding it over some of these other units is that he's sitting here and he has this Thomas Kench pair. He's going to sell the Katarina for the Gragas pair. So he has the Gragas pair as well as the Cassante pair. He has a lot of frontline. What he needs is damage. So he's going to hold the Bard because it's actually going to give him the best potential damage output out of the units he can hold. So he's holding it instead of like the Katarina, just because the Bard is going to synergize better with the Cassantes than the Katarina would. Uh, we see here his first augments. He was offered support cash, which is solid at 2-1. But clear mind right now, I would probably just consider better as well. Uh, Volterix also really likes to open fort a lot, and clear mind is really strong on open fort. Uh, so he's rolling past support cash. Infusion's also a really bad augment at 2-1, so he's going to roll past that as well. And then Golden Ticket, not a very strong augment currently. Contagion is actually pretty good at like 4-2. It's like a little above average, I'd say. But it's not very strong at 2-1. So he's just going to end up going with Clear Mind because it's a very strong augment right now. And again, Volterix really likes to open Fort. And it's really strong with that playstyle. Now, Volta makes a very interesting play right here. Most people would either play three units on their board and slam an item. Or they would play two units like this and not slam an item, right? They'd either play two units because they're trying to open Fort. Just make that 10 gold here and try and lose streak. Or they'd try and play three units to try and win streak. But Volta basically says, okay, I want to make 10 this round because I don't really care about any of these units. I don't care about this Evelyn. I don't care about this Annie. I don't really care about these other units that I had. I'm going to make 10 this round because the Jinx is good because I can potentially play a rapid fire opener. And the Cassante 2 is obviously just a strong unit. I'm going to slam an item, try and potentially be strong right now. And then next turn, I'll automatically level up to 4 with the clear mind. And then I have a good chance to hit a good headliner here and actually start playing a strong board and potentially play for a win streak right here. But I'm making 10 as well. So if I don't see a good shop next round, I can just start selling stuff and start trying to hit Eco because he would have been able to make 10 this round anyways. Now, he actually sees the Bard Dazzler headliner. Now, this is not a headliner I usually buy, but it is very, very good if you have a strong frontline, which Volta definitely has here. He's sitting here with the Cassante 2 with Steadfast Heart as well as an open Warmogs. Again, it's loaded Carousel. He can, sorry, open Belt. It's loaded Carousel. He can probably finish out a second tank item on the Cassante. And Bard headliner is just really, really powerful if you have a good frontline because so much of his power is in the healing. So one thing I do think is very good is if you're sitting here with a strong frontliner like this, always buy this Bard headliner. He's going to do a lot of work. You'll see throughout these fights, it does a good amount of damage and a ton of healing. And even though he only has one frontliner without even a synergy active, right? This is a no Sentinel Cassante. It ends up actually sustaining through a lot of these fights. Last round, he bought the Vex here just because it was his strongest unit. He wasn't making 10 gold anyways here. And then he's going to make another smart play here, which is he could play this board keep the Vex on the board, but it's actually slightly stronger to just level and play these two one cost units. And then he can still make 10 by selling the Vex. And looking at his gold right here, if he wins this round, as long as he gets a two cost off of Carousel, he'll be able to make 20 next round anyways. So leveling here is basically no punish. I mean, this is standard clear mind gameplay right here would be to auto level on 2-2 and then level here while still staying 10 gold. Uh, so I really like this play from him. A lot of the times you'll like level at 2-1 but then it's a lot harder to make the Econ here because you didn't get the 10 gold at 2-1 then. Uh, so I really actually like how he's playing around the clear mind and that way he's able to hit his Econ thresholds this way. Now, looking at this board right here, you potentially want this blue buff here, but you're probably not getting a double tier because uh, that would be a good bard item. And then if you're not getting that, you probably want to play around a Cassante item right here. So looking at this, you want to go for a three cost for the most amount of money and he ends up going with a Lulu because it allows him to finish out a Warmogs, making a really strong frontline. Because of this, he's actually going to have a really good board uh, getting this Warmogs, Cassante, going to be a lot tankier, especially because he still doesn't have Sentinel, doesn't have another frontliner. 
This Cassante has to live for him to be able to win fights, but it can live because he has this Bard. Now, he's going to take a slightly risky play here, sit at 19. He scouts around. He should be able to win the round no matter what, though. He's sitting here with this Bard 2, with this Cassante 2, with two good items. So he should always be able to win and hit that 20 gold threshold. And he plays the Lulu because Lulu is just going to make his board a lot better and give him a lot of potential to play around something like Spellweaver in the mid game and potentially transition into an Ari comp later. When you're playing Clear Mind, what you should always be thinking about is playing units that will build towards your late game board. A lot of the time, I'm a big fan of just always playing your strongest board. Uh, that way, you know, you can always just build up units on your bench later and transition out of your strongest board into something that's, you know, more aligned with what you're looking for at, later on in the game. But with Clear Mind, you don't really have that luxury of building stuff on your bench. So you kind of have to try and both keep a strong board and play towards things that you can play later. And playing around this Lulu here is going to open up the option for him to play around Spellweaver units, which could potentially be a great out right here if he gets some AP items like a blue buff or a Shoujin. Especially with his Bard, he can slam AP items, which is probably what he's looking to do. And then he can start building out units that like this Lulu and then uh, other Spellweaver units and then transition into some sort of Ari board potentially later down the road. Uh, he could also potentially transition into some sort of Twisted Fate board because it should be easier to hold it should be easy to hold Dazzlers if you're playing around this Bard, uh, etc. Because looking at the spot, you would ideally be playing around AP because you have this Bard Headliner. Obviously, hitting this Echo here is going to be a huge hit for him because it's going to enable him to have that Sentinel. And then if he can just get another Spellweaver, he's going to be able to activate that 3 Spellweaver, which is great if you're playing around any AP carry because uh, it's going to be giving 15 AP to that Bard, increasing his damage as well as his healing. And then he manages to make the 20 gold, 40 gold right here. Uh, one thing that's a little strange is he played the second Bard as opposed to the second Lulu. He could have played the second Lulu and still guaranteed made 40 this round, but it ended up not hurting him too much. And then here's an important thing to note if you're playing Clear Mind. Now, his strongest board right here, realistically, is probably to play this Misfortune, right? You have Jazz with the Bard. You can play this Misfortune over probably one of these Lulus right here. And even though you don't have that many, you don't have that many traits in, you'd be four traits of Jazz. You know, it's probably going to be better than a random Lulu. But when you're playing around Clear Mind, you always need to play around your pairs. The reasoning for this is let's say he buys this Misfortune, right? then he can't hold Lulu Pair. And he doesn't really have that much potential to make his board better. If you don't have pairs, you, your board can't get better, right? Normally, you would just hold the pair on the bench, and then you can potentially get, you know, stronger by hitting it later. But with Clear Mind, you can't put units on your bench, uh, so you have to play your pairs on board. So I highly recommend whenever you're playing Clear Mind, always try and play your pairs. That way you have at least the potential to high roll into one of those pairs later. Looking at this augment right here, Crown Guarded is not a bad augment, but he already has three items on his Cassante, so he can't put it on there. Twin Terror just doesn't make any sense from this spot, so he's going to reroll past these. Heroic Grab Bag doesn't make sense. He's playing Clear Mind. You want to be playing a, uh, you know, a level 8, level 9 comp with Clear Mind. Heroic Grab Bag is for reroll comps. He's not going to be doing that. Capricious is actually not bad here. He could go Capricious on the Bard, uh, but I do think Jeweled Lotus is just the best augment right here. Again, he's trying to play around AP. You're sitting here with an open tier, so you could potentially go for a Shoujin or a blue buff, play around AP. You're playing around this Bard, so you can always slam those AP items on him. And then looking at this, you have two Lulus and a Bard. They're all going to really enjoy this Jeweled Lotus. It's going to buff up their damage a lot. Uh, so Jeweled Lotus is just a great take right here because it's so good in AP comps. It's also good in AD comps, but especially AP comps because they're all their damage is from casting uh, that I really like Jeweled Lotus. And then, yeah, he just levels to seven right here for Annie. One thing I generally do like to do is if you are win streaking and you can stay 30 gold, I just always like to level. He's technically off interval here. He's two out of 48 instead of zero out of 48. But it doesn't matter because you're staying 30 gold, right? There's no real punish. Even if you lose your win streak, it doesn't cost you that much gold. If you go down to like 20 gold here, that's really risky. Because if you lose your streak at 20 gold, it's going to take a while to build your economy back up. But even losing your streak at 30 gold is not a big deal, right? Even if you lose it, you can still make 40 the next round. Now, obviously, he can't make 40 the next round because he has the Lulu. But, I mean, that's just a high roll, right? Hitting the Lulu here, you're not going to complain about hitting your two-star Lulu. And because he played around those pairs, playing a slightly weaker board at 3-1, he's able to have a much stronger board right now. Overall, this is going to save him more HP being able to play the double Lulu than it would be to play the slightly stronger board. So, yeah, just seeing really good play uh, in terms of... Just staying strong with clear mind, playing around the correct units, playing around your pairs, uh, and leveling aggressively, but not too aggressively, right? If he levels to 7 on like 3-1, that's a stupid play. You're losing so much money. But just leveling to 7 at 30 gold, just really strong, safe, but, you know, powerful play uh, coming out from Volta that I think is just really clean. Looking at this carousel right here, he has open belt on his Cassante, open tier on the Bard. So really, you would like to try and go for a Bard item right here. 
uh, just because you're kind of lacking in the damage department and you're probably always going to end up with some sort of tank item later on anyways. He wanted the tier for the blue buff here but was unable to get it. So he's kind of forced to choose between double belt, uh, sorry, double glove and belt plus glove. Uh, and in this case here, double glove doesn't do that much because like you can't put the, you know, you can't make, make guard breaker on the Cassante. That's going to be bad. And you don't really want to make hand of justice as your first item. Uh, you're not trying to play around a melee carry in this position. So he's forced to just take belt glove, which is fine. Uh, you can just go second or monks on the Cassante. And then you can just use the glove and tier for whatever items you want on your carry. You actually stay pretty flexible with glove plus tier open. Uh, you could play AD or AP depending on what items you hit off of the creep round. And then he hits the Alawi, which is just a really good hit, obviously. Alawi at level 7 is pretty high roll. It's going to buff his frontline a lot. If you see here, the way he has his tentacles positioned is actually a tech you can do versus KD8 Akali. Uh, if KD8 Akali goes into your board and you have the tentacles like this, she just ends up jumping between the tentacles basically the entire round and like doesn't hit any of the actual units on your board. So it's really powerful into that. That being said, I don't really know why he has them positioned like this, because there's probably not any KD Akalis in the lobby right now. Um, and I don't think there was, like, even if he scouted. So he should probably just have these tentacles on the front line currently, uh, just to use them for a bit more HP for his board. But yeah, this is a cool tech that you can utilize, just probably not in his spot right here. And so looking at his spot, he's playing Clear Mind here. He's quite rich, and standard practice for Clear Mind is to go level 8 at 4-1. So most likely we're going to see him selling this bard uh, in the next round. That way he can guarantee get a new headliner at 4-1 and then just roll down at 4-1 to try and stabilize. The ideal way you play clear mind is you save a bunch of HP stage 2-3. He did that great. He got his econ up too, so he's quite rich. Rich enough to go level 8 on 4-1. You want to roll down at 4-1, hit a decent board to stabilize, and then just go level 9. You don't want to get stuck at level 8. You don't want to get stuck with a bunch of pairs. Uh, because if you're just using clear mind to get to level eight, really not that good. What makes clear mind so good is the ability to then just go level nine afterwards. And you can get so far ahead of the rest of the lobby in terms of econ, because you're getting that extra three XP per turn, uh, that you can just end up winning the game. So you want to just roll at four one until you have a stable enough board and then just go level eight, even if you don't have everything perfectly upgraded. In fact, sometimes you have to go with a more suboptimal board because you just want to hit as quickly as possible. That way you don't have to hold pairs and you can just immediately go to level nine which we're actually going to see him do very well here. So I'm actually going to turn to 1x speed right here for the rolldown. That way we can talk about the rolldown in detail. Now, looking at his components right here, sitting here, we have sword, glove, tier, chain, bow. Uh, you can really flex between AP and AD here. Uh, if you go AD, this is Infinity Edge. You can play around bow for like a red buff. The tier could be like a blue buff if you're playing like Ezreal or like a Hand of Justice or whatnot. Uh, you can also play around AP here. You can go Shoujin. And then you can use the glove for like a jewel gauntlet or something, the bow for like a Nashers. Um, so this is good to play around both either AP or AD. So this is one of the really nice things about what he did playing around these frontline items is it kept him really open to what he can hit on this 4-1 rolldown. That way, if he hits an AD chosen, he can play around that. If he hits an AP chosen, he can play around that. Now looking at this, he does have a lot of Spellweaver units. So the quickest thing he could do is actually hit like an Ari and play around that. So looking at this, obviously hits a bunch of Blitzcranks. Picks those up. Uh, Blitzcrank 2 is going to be a strong, stable frontline. And then he hits the Spellweaver Headliner Ari. Now, this is a little bit high roll. I mean, you've got the Blitzcrank 2 and the Headliner Ari immediately on your rolldown. But I think what he does here is really smart. Now, the current best way to play Ari is to play around 6 Sentinel. That's the standard way to play Ari. You go Ari 2, you play 6 Sentinel, and you just have an insane amount of frontline. But Volterix has clear mind. That might be the optimal way to play Ari. But if you notice, he doesn't have that many Sentinel units. He only has an Echo and this Blitzcrank 2. He doesn't have this Sentinel board, but what he does have is these Spellweaver boards. And 7 Spellweaver Ari is good enough. You don't need to have 6 Sentinel Ari to win during Stage 4, right? If you can just play the 7 Spellweaver and then go level 9, level 10, cap around like a Sona 2, that's going to be strong enough to win the game. So he actually plays the 7 Spellweaver board as opposed to a standard Ari board because he just hits it immediately and there's no point in rolling anymore. So especially when you're in a spot like this where you're super ahead, don't get baited into rolling for the best board possible. If you hit a good enough board on your level 8 rolldown, keep it, go level 9, go level 10, whatever you can do, cap around there, and you'll have a much better time than trying to get the perfect board right here. If Ulta rolls to 0, he's going to have an unupgraded Sentinel board, and he's going to be like 30 gold down. He might even have to hold some pairs. He's going to lose a ton of clear mind value. So this is a much better play in practice, and I think he did it really well. Looking at these augments right here, the biggest thing he's lacking is damage. He has this three item uh, Blitzcrank 2. He has enough frontline. He doesn't need to take Crash Test Dummies or Martyr because there's no more frontline he needs. Again, he doesn't need Inspiring Epitaph because he doesn't need more frontline. He has enough. But he has a one item Ari. 
he needs some damage. So he takes little buddies here because it's going to give a bunch of attack speed to his Ari. It also works really well in Spellweaver. Uh, there's a few different, you know, low-cost Spellweavers you can play, right? He has two different two costs on his board right now. So the Ari is gaining 18% attack speed. It's going to buff up her damage a lot. And it's going to allow him to cap super high around Ari plus Sona. One other thing to note is that he did have a Sona pair last turn, but he sold the Sona pair. Uh, again, that's just standard play for Clear Mind. If you have a pair, but your board's strong enough to go level 9, you just have to sell it with Clear Mind. Uh, you can just find it again at level 9. No big deal. So there's really not too much for the rest of the stage here. He's really going to sit here, try and build out his Ari items, and he's just going to be able to go level 9 super easily on stage 5 because, his, again, his board is strong enough. Even if he loses a round, he's not going to lose badly. He has a lot of damage coming out. 7 Spellweaver Ari. Even though she doesn't have 3 items, she has 7 Spellweaver. She's going to get a bunch of kills. So yeah, he's just in a very stable spot right here, and we'll be able to just go level 9 easily. This happens a lot whenever you play Clear Mind. If you can save the HP early, you can just kind of snowball that super, super hard. That's why I love this augment is if you save that HP early, you can, at level 8, roll down and not hit a perfect board, and it's fine, because even if you lose a couple rounds, not a big deal, you're ahead on HP, you just go level 9 for free, and you just win the game that way. Continuing along, we go into the carousel right here. Now, of course, you're going to try and fill out these RE items right here. We have enough frontline, we need some damage on our board. Uh, you're sitting here with open bow and open gloves, so you want to play around one of those for an RE item. Ideally, you'd be getting a belt here, that way you can get a Nasher's Tooth for your RE. Uh, because it's like her second best item after blue buff. We see here, takes the bow plus belt and gets the Nasher's Tooth the Ari, uh, which is going to be buffing up his damage a lot more. And now he actually has a pretty respectable damage output with this two item Ari. He can get that third item after the creep round pretty easily. Bow could be a lot of different things. Could be Giant Slayer for the Ari, could be a red buff for the Sona, could be a Rage Blade for the Sona, could be a second Nasher's for the Ari. Glove could also be Guard Breaker or Dual Gauntlet Ari. So he has a bunch of options. The likelihood that he doesn't have a three item Ari after the creep round is extremely, extremely low. You see, he loses this round, but not a big deal. He doesn't care that much about streaking at this point. He's 60 gold. He's super rich. He's going to go level 9 next stage for free, basically, regardless. So it doesn't care too much about losing his streak. He has plenty of HP, and everything is going to be completely fine. And yeah, not much uh, for this next round right here. He's just scouting, changing his positioning slightly. But you just see he has this Ari in the middle right here. Uh, I typically prefer Ari in the middle. It ends up being a bit safer. That way, Crowd Divers don't jump on the Ari, because if you have her in the corner, obviously Crowd Divers will jump on her and she'll get stunned. Uh, so I generally just prefer to have her in the corner. The one nice thing about his tentacle positioning is it does take Crowd Divers from the right side, so they don't actually jump on the Sona. Uh, so this left tentacle here, actually really good positioning in this fight, because you saw here the Sona never got stunned, because all the Crowd Divers went onto her. And obviously right now he's playing Attack Speed Sona, because that's just the standard way you play Sona, is go Attack Speed. It's the best variant right now. You'll actually see later on, he actually plays around with the variant on the Sona a bit. The one interesting thing is this is basically the one scenario where you can go damage Sona once he gets to Sona 2. Because with 7 Spellweaver, damage Sona actually ends up being quite good. Uh, generally, damage Sona isn't strong enough, but with 7 Spellweaver, it actually does enough if you get to the Sona 2. Uh, so looking at his item components right here, uh, I want to ask what you guys would make in this spot. And think through what items you would make. Uh, pause the video if you need to. Now, personally, whenever I was initially watching this game, I looked and I saw this sword and I went, oh, we have Gunblade Ari because Ari's best item is either going to be, uh, best item build is going to be blue buff slash Shojin plus Nashers plus Gunblade. That's standard Ari. But that's actually not the correct play. I, I That's what I saw. I kind of tunnel visioned on getting best in slot Ari. But in reality here, sword is the correct take. But we're playing clear mind. We're level 9 with 30 gold. We can potentially go level 10 here, or we can, like, roll a bunch at level 9. We're playing around the Sona for our cap. Sona, Sona 2 is going to be the way we win the game. So it's always Shojin. Shojin is Sona's best item. You also make a Rage Blade, second best item. So we can really build for the strong Sona, and then you still end up with Guardbreaker Ari. Like, this Ari build's fine. There's no issue with this Ari build. Obviously, this isn't, like, you know, super bis Ari. But if you're going to be capping around the Sona 2 anyways, it's fine if your Ari items aren't perfect because your Sona items are perfect. And she's going to be what wins you the game, not the Ari. That's again, still just plays the 7 Spellweaver. Now, I think most people, including me here, would actually roll at, you know, level 9 to try and stabilize the board a bit better, right? We have some upgrades we can hit. We're sitting here on Gragas 1, Seraphine 1, Echo 1, Akali 1, Sona 1, right? Alawi 1. There's a lot of upgrades we can hit. But Voltec kind of just looks at a spot, looks at the lobby and says, you know what? I'm strong enough. Like, this is good enough. I have strong frontline. I have strong damage. I don't need all these upgrades. I have good augments. So I'm just going to play this board right here and go level 10, which is really smart because level 10 is going to now allow him to cap out a lot higher. At level 10, you can basically pick and choose what five costs you hit. You see so many five costs in your shop that you'll always hit what you want. 
if you're rolling at level nine, there's a good chance you miss. Obviously, there's a there's a good chance you hit, right? You're rolling at level nine, you're probably gonna hit the Sona too if you're rolling like 70 gold at nine, but you could miss the Sona and not hit that Sona too. But at level nine, you're gonna hit the Sona. Now here, he does a really smart play. This is just a tech you can do if you're playing with clear mind, is if you're sitting here and you're trying to push levels, this can happen at level eight, level nine, and you see a unit that gives you a pair and you really want this unit, you don't wanna buy it because it's gonna, you know, make you lose the clear mind value. So you lock the shot for it. Uh, we see here he went for damage Sona. Damage Sona on Sona 1 is not correct. You're going to watch this fight and he's going to switch back immediately after this fight. It's actually good on the Sona 2, but not on the Sona 1. And he realizes this after this fight. Uh, the attack speed would be a lot stronger right here. The Sona just doesn't do that much damage. Locking the shop right here is super good because basically one shop you see is basically worth two gold. You can think about it that way because it costs two gold to refresh a shop. But not having a unit on your bench gives you three gold. So by locking the shop, he's losing two gold a turn because he's not seeing an extra shop. But he's getting the clear mind value, so it's basically plus one gold a turn by locking the shop right here, because you of course always want the second Sona. Uh, you're never going to give up the second Sona, because she's the best unit you can have, because you really want to get this Sona 3 right here. Uh, Item-wise right here, he's just going to try and finish out his Sona with this Nashers makes perfect sense. That way he can just have a three item Sona. And he actually does opt to put it on the Lulu instead of the Sona. Uh, I was mistaken, which actually does make sense. It's a Lulu too, so it actually isn't even that bad. I think Lulu does use Nashers better than the Sona does anyways. Um, Sona's like pretty high mana pool. She likes the attack speed though, uh, but Nashers does work better on low mana pool units. That way they can constantly fresh, refresh it. So he ends up putting the Nashers on the Sona. Another thing you could consider doing is taking Redemption and just putting on like the Alawi or something. That way you can help heal the Blitzcrank as well as give him that uh, AoE damage reduction. One thing I don't like about his positioning here is he has the Lulu between his Ari and his Seraphine. You should be putting the Lulu between the Ari and the Sona. That way it can give the attack speed and the mana to the Sona. Uh, is going to be pretty significant. You see here, he does fix that, putting the Lulu between both of them. And obviously, he replaces the Akali with the uh, Kaisa, just because he has little buddies. So now he has three units giving little buddies, uh, which is a good bit better. And yeah, he switches back to the attack speed, because if you're if you're playing a Sona 1, you should always just have attack speed. Uh, dam damage Sona 1 just doesn't do anything, even with Spell Spellweaver. And look, he's losing these fights here, right? His board's not great. He is mostly unupgraded. He has like the RA2 and the Blitz 2 and the Lulu 2, but that's basically it. He's not playing like a super, you know, meta comp, right? Seven Spellweaver, it's not a bad board, but it's not an amazing board. He doesn't have any like two-star legendaries to, to cap the board out. But he had so much HP that he saved earlier from how he played the early game that it doesn't matter. He can just greed this level 10 here and guarantee that he can cap out and win the lobby, right? If he rolled at nine, he could easily just go second tier. But going 10, he can just guarantee a first place finish. Uh, so looking here, not too much interesting about this roll down. He's basically just going to buy the Sona 2 and play more or less the same board. Uh, that he had right here. Uh, I do forget what he puts in as the last unit. He puts in Kiana, which makes sense. Kiana is just a great plus one unit to any board. She's probably the second best just splashable unit in the game after Alawi, because Alawi obviously provides so much free frontline, but he already has this Alawi in. Uh, so he ends up just going with the Kiana here because she can print a couple extra items for your team throughout the fight. Um, and then, yeah, ops for the Shojin for the Sona. So ends up getting rewarded for greeting, not putting the Nashers on the Sona because a second Shoujin is better than the Nashers. Now that he has the seven Spellweaver Sona too, he can actually consider playing around with the Sona a bit and actually switch over to like a damage Sona uh, as opposed to attack speed, which I believe he did do. Uh, I do want to double check if he ended up swapping that last round. Okay, no, so she's still on the attack speed, um, but he can actually consider playing around like a damage, uh, a damage Sona in this spot. Obviously just rolling to try and finish out his frontline upgrades. This Alawi 2 would be a huge... Uh, upgrade to his frontline, and he does switch over to the damage here, which I think makes sense. Uh, attack speed Zona is really good if you have strong frontline, but you're playing around 7 Spellweaver right here, your frontline's not amazing. You know, by the time she gets that attack speed ult off, a lot of times the Blitzkrank will already be dead. So just opting for the damage, that way you can just burst through things really quickly. That's generally how you want to cap around 7 Spellweaver. If you're playing 7 Spellweaver, you should pretty much always cap your board around Sona too. Uh, so really good at recognition from him to not just default to going the attack speed Sona, that's like the standard meta right now and instead switch to the Sona that actually fits his board the best. And at this point, his board's basically done. He ended up kind of low rolling his roll down, honestly. He didn't hit like the Alawi 2 or Kiana 2 or anything, even though he had so much gold. He did hit the Sona 2 though, so it's like relatively acceptable. Uh, but at this point, he does need to just focus on his positioning. He's into two melee comps. Ari ends up doing decently into melee carries uh, because she can stun them and then just burst them down because she has such strong single target damage. And Sona can kind of clean up the rest of the board. Uh, so he could, who goes into the Jax player right here. And yeah, manages to beat the Ghost. Uh, so now it's a 1v1, him versus Alan, uh, who is playing the Yone 3 board. Uh, and we'll actually see what Volta does to beat this. So ends up actually going for Dragonclaw Yorick. Dragonclaw? 
really bad for him in the spot. He's versus Yone Reroll. Dragon Claw doesn't do anything versus Yone Reroll. But he takes the Dragon Claw to deny it from Alan because Dragon Claw is super good into Ari. Remember, Ari's only hitting one unit at a time. So if she gets stuck on a Dragon Claw, it mitigates her damage a ton. So he take it, takes it to deny. Really, really good recognition from uh, Volta to take the Dragon Claw because no item that he could have taken would be as good for him as Dragon Claw would be for Alan. Most people would just take their best item from themselves. But taking that right there, really good recognition. Now, one thing with Damage Sona is her damage is a bit spread out. She's not the greatest into Yone. You know, Yone, super high HP, heal stuff back. You really need to have strong, like, single target burst to kill it, which is Ari. Ari can do that. Sona doesn't really do that that well. Now, Volta actually makes a really interesting decision. And he says, okay, I have double Shoujin Rageblade. If I go heal and shield, I'm actually going to have pretty good shield uptime. My issue is that Yone is just one-shotting my board before I can kill the Yone. My Sona is really not doing, like, attack speed, if I go attack speed Sona, my team will be dead before, you know, you can fully utilize the attack speed. If I go damage, it's not going to kill the Yone. So I'm going to go heal and shield, that way I can stall a bit longer versus the Yone, and hopefully the Ari can kill the Yone. Now, I always say, never go heal shield Sona, I think it completely sucks. And I agree with that, like, 99% of the time, I think it's wrong. But this is the rare situation where switching over to heal shield actually makes a good amount of sense. And you can stall just a little bit longer, just a little bit longer versus the Yone, giving you enough time to kill it and actually win him the fight. And because he has heal shield, he ends up not having like any of his units die and he's able to kill Alan even though he's 18 HP and he successfully wins the game. So really good recognition on switching over the Sona there. I think if he stuck with the default attack speed that most players would have, probably myself included, he would have actually probably lost that 1v1 because uh, the Yone would have kind of just cleaved through everything and the attack speed wouldn't have made that big of a deal because it would have... You know, he would have been able to do a bit more damage, but the Yone would just be able to heal off and get through everything, especially if he was also the damage Sona. The Yone would be able to heal that off, and then the attack speed, his whole team might just be dead before uh, they can fully utilize all of the attack speed. So really good recognition from Volta. I thought this game was just really clean. This is basically exactly how you ideally want to play a clear mind game. I thought he, how he played the stage 2 was really cool, making the 10 on 2-1. That way he was able to hit his econ thresholds uh, while just auto-leveling to 4. Usually when I play clear mind, I just level to 4 on 2-1, and then you still hit the same... Level intervals, but because he made the 10 on 2-1, it was really easy for him to hit his econ intervals. So really good. Really good to recognize that the Dazzler Bard was good in his spot. Because he had a strong frontline, and Bard is strong with a strong frontline. Uh, and yeah, just was able to stay strong throughout the early game. Rolls down the perfect amount at level 8. Doesn't overroll. Just goes with what board he has. Plays what the game gave him. Doesn't try and force the stronger RA comp, which is the 6 Sentinel version. Just goes with the 7 Spellweaver that he had. Uh, and stayed strong that way was able to just go 9, and then recognize that he had enough HP so that he didn't even have to roll at level 9. He could just go level 10, guarantee the game, uh, chose the right Sona option for the final fight to be able to win it out, and just really good recognition on you know what items to make throughout the game and how to stay strong at all points. I thought this was just a really cleanly played game. Even if nothing he did was like super, super crazy, I thought everything he did was just really clean, uh, and he made very few mistakes throughout the game. And so I wanted to share it, because especially if you're wondering how to play Clear Mind, this is what the ideal Clear Mind game looks like. If you enjoyed this content, make sure to subscribe and let me know if you want to see more, uh, because I definitely would be down to do more VOD reviews like this in the future. I watch a lot of TFT, and there's a lot of really cool games that I see that I would like to be able to share with you guys. So please let me know, and I will see you guys next video.